स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया surrealism is a continuation or a fallout of dadaism and the movement started in 1924 but uh, before surrealism as a movement actually started we back in 1914-15 around that time an artist in italy called giorgio de tirico was producing certain paintings which already anticipated a surrealist approach to art specifically to the subject matter content and also the composition of a painting this is one such example of a painting by kiriko the title itself is quite suggestive because it says melancholy and mystery of a street and it's no wonder that kiriko is considered to be the precursor of surrealism first of all because he called his style as metaphysical as an alternate reality or beyond the immediate reality and if we look at his paintings not just this one but any paintings by kiriko we will certainly feel that all his paintings almost all of his paintings uh, have an overwhelming sense of anxiety or more than anxiety i would say a sense of eerie uncanny quality a sense of mystery and unknownness leading to a certain kind of anxiety like this one and a a, a feeling of Uh, a world beyond our immediate perceived reality so these are all elements which would find um, a lot of uh, explorations and which will certainly bloom in the surrealist movement so kiriko happens to be a role model for surrealist painters for uh, these very reasons and when actually surrealism started when actually we look at this transition from dadaism to surrealism in 1924 and when you look at what the surrealist leaders like andre breton louis arago paul eluard they were all uh, kind of uh, the way they were conceiving the whole idea the way they were articulating the surrealist concept it already uh, it is very clear that kiriko was already anticipating these elements now as opposed to dadaism surrealism was more productive rather than anarchic or nihilistic and the if you look at some similarity with dadaism of course the fact that like dadaism surrealism was also a kind of rebel a revolution against the established and the prevalent ways of doing a painting and secondly like dadaism and more than dadaism like kiriko's metaphysical paintings surrealist painters and artists also looked beyond the immediate reality sir realism beyond realism because they were convinced that reality cannot be perceived or understood from its conscious level we need to look at what's going on at the subconscious or even unconscious level and as a result 
surrealist artists were hugely dependent on the element of dream as a source of their subject matters, element of dream as a source of their visual idea. For example, when Dali painted the famous painting called The Persistence of Memory in 1931, he frequently described his paintings as hand painted dream. Now, Dali was also very interested in Sigmund Freud's writings on psychology. Now, this is uh, very significant that why Salvador Dali would be so much interested in Sigmund Freud's psychological ideas. Precisely because this Austrian psychologist writing in the late 19th and early 20th century, Freud revolutionized the way people think about the mind with his theory of the unconscious. The unconscious is the part of a psyche that thinks and feels without the person being aware of those thoughts and feelings. And as an extension, the unconscious may seem extremely irrational, illogical, and even unscientific. But for artists like Dali and later and Margarete and others, unconscious, this whole idea of unconscious or subconscious appeared to be a treasure trove for painterly ideas, visual themes, and subject matters. After all, if uh, we follow Freud, um, he did say that dreams are coded messages from the unconscious, and certainly start is very interested in what could be revealed by their dreams. So, if you look at surrealist painters' artworks like this one, The Persistence of Memory, uh, painted in 1931 by Salvador Dali, you can clearly see that the very fact that he hangs the clocks and the watches, almost like the way we hang our clothes, in a sense, he dilutes our sense of time. Because what he wants to state very clearly through these symbols is that in dream we lose our ordered sense of time. We tend to experience a fluidity of time and also uh, an experience of suspended time where the clock may even stop ticking but the time will move on in its own way. So this elasticity of time, or experience of time, that we often experience in dreams, was uh, one of the main concerns of Dali in this painting. Whereas he and other surrealist painters have already been aware of the possibility of painting where some kind of uh, a sense of a sinister atmosphere not just melancholy or mystery, but also a sense of fear can pervade uh, in the atmosphere of a painting. And also, that the fact that a painting may not have everything that is explicable. There could be elements which you cannot explain, inexplicable elements, or incongruous elements, elements which may not go with each other. They look absolutely in contrast to each other. Hence, absurdity. And absurdity often leads to some funny situations, some ridiculous situations. So all these elements will be uh, used and explored by the surrealist artists. Now, so we have at least two pre-surrealist artists called Mark Chagall and Giorgio de Chirico. Chirico's work we have seen just now. And artists who were directly a part of surrealist movement where at least some of them are John Miro, Paul Clay, Salvador Dali, and René Magritte. Now, surrealism flourished in Europe between World Wars I and II in 1924 and grew out of the earlier data movement. This is also true. And before World War I produced works of NPR that deliberately defied reason. We have seen that this is what the other uh, art did. But then surrealism's emphasis was not on negation but on positive expression. 
In fact, according to the major spokesman of the movement, the poet and critic Andre Breton, who published the Surrealist Manifesto in 1934, Surrealism united conscious and unconscious realms of experience so that the world of dream and fantasy would be joined to the everyday rational world in an absolute reality, a surreality. This is what he clearly states in this manifesto. And as we have already mentioned, that surrealist artist drew heavily on theories adopted from Sigmund Freud, and Breton saw this unconscious as the wellspring of the imagination. He defined genius in terms of accessibility to this normally untapped real, which he believed could be attained by poets and painters. Now, as unconscious or the realm of unconscious becomes the main target uh, by the surrealist artists. So, naturally, this uh, incongruous elements, absurdity, uh, a sense of anxiety, unknownness, a sinister feeling, all these things would be there. And added to that, because it is a visual exercise, because we are talking about a visual creativity. So added to that, something else also happens uh, without much pre-planning. But once it happens, then Salvador Dali or Rene Magritte noticed it, picked it up, and convert it into one of their the salient features of their artwork, and that is visual, visual or visual illusion. For example, if you look at this painting very carefully, you will find multiple images appearing from the same form. Sometimes it looks like a dog, sometimes it looks like a face of a woman, sometimes it looks like something else. Now, isn't it something that happens in dreams too? That images, figures, appearances keep exchanging their identities. So, dream is about, apart from everything else, it is also about an element of confusion, where we get confused because of its absurdity. Appearances confuse us. And through his paintings, Dali, by invoking the subconscious, has always tried to confuse the viewers with rapidly changing and rapidly overlapping visual elements. Because after all, surrealism was a style of art and literature that stressed the subconscious or non-rational. And surrealist images emerged from the practice of automatism or through the exploitation of chance effects or unexpected juxtapositions as well. And this is also interesting because it is that it talks about a certain kind of practice of art making or even literary practice where the entire thing may not be preconceived. You allow the chance or accident to play a role. And if you're sharp enough, if you're alert enough, you'll pick that up and you'll try to it. Because you see, they believe that even in our subconscious and dreams, there are plenty of chance elements and accidental elements that play a role and inform the experience. Then why not let that happen to our artwork as well? So, surrealism was not just an art movement because it was a kind of philosophy that embraced literature, music, cinema, and popular culture. Now, Dali, obviously one of the most well-known uh, artists of not only surrealism but modern art in general. Now, Salvador Dali is obviously the is often the first name we associate with surrealism. But uh, historically speaking, he did not join the movement until 1929, five years after its founding. But then again, he was kicked out of the movement in 1939 because of his fascist leanings. But anyways, Dali was something like an exhibitionist. He loved to get publicity by talking or provoking his critics. He spent the war years, World War II, in America where he made a fortune, working with advertisers and with Disney. So all said and done, Dali created 
some of the most wonderful, fascinating and magnificent, magnificent artworks which truly upheld the notion of surrealism to a great extent. Because Dali was able to not only conceive an image, a surrealist image, but he was one extremely skillful artist who was able to execute a surrealist image with a great amount of accuracy because of his very strong academic career. I mean, look at this painting called The Metamorphosis of Narcissus. Whatever might be the title suggesting, but when you begin to look at the painting and you keep staring at the painting for a long time, even before you realize, the painting begins to reveal itself to you gradually. It is like unfolding of a drama or unfolding of an experience that you had in your dreams, in your subconscious. Though, in terms of its technical execution, every element that has been painted here has a crystal clear clarity. But, as far as our cognitive connection or experience with this painting is concerned, nothing is revealing itself at once. It is all happening over a period of time, gradually. Gradually, you keep discovering the elements in the painting. You keep discovering how the elements in the painting are also exchanging their identities, overlapping with their identities. You keep discovering the even content of the painting the way you discover your subconscious. So the very experience of looking at Dali's painting and understanding Dali's painting is tantamount to looking at your inner self and exploring your subconscious. For example, this one also. Or this one. Once again, you look at this painting from distance, you go back, look back at the painting again, come close. Every time you look at the painting, there is a possibility that you forget your first impression and discover something else when you look back at the painting again. So one single painting is able to offer several views, several visions, and several appearances. Now, Dali is playing with his incredible skill, of course. He is playing with this possibility of um, creating visual riddles or visual illusions. And he does that most successfully because he uh, had that what we call realistic, academic, and technical skill of finishing a work of art to the extent that he could create an illusion. And it is happening again and again in many of his paintings. So, right at the outset, almost all the paintings of Dali are a kind of a vision or a view or a visual experience beyond this immediate world which means Dali is continuously addressing the subconscious. Rene Magritte was also doing the similar thing, but slightly in a more um, intellectual way, in the sense that Rene Magritte was, of course, like Dali, drawing a lot from the theory of subconscious, the theory of dreams, but more than invoking the experience of dreams, Magritte was interested in uh, provoking the paradoxes of language and particularly visual language. In fact, Magritte loved to use the props of normalcy in order to upend, invert, and collapse them, leading the viewer into the unknown territory where life leaves off and art begins. Because Magritte once said that the mind loves the unknown. It loves images whose meaning is unknown, since the meaning of the mind itself is unknown. And he plays 
with this strange relationship between what is known and what is unknown. And this particular painting by Mahathir, which he did around 1928-29, has since then become one of the iconic images uh, to, to demonstrate the problematic relationship between two kinds of languages, that is the visual language and textual language. Because in terms of its visual appearance, this image represents a pipe, a smoking pipe, right? And what is written below in print, it says that this is not a pipe. This is a pipe, you make a pipe, but the text says this is not a pipe. Now, there is nothing more problematic with the imagery of the painting itself, but philosophically, this painting is supposed to provoke and problematize questions about language itself. So the treasury of images is perhaps Margarita's best known work, and Margarita is reminding the viewer that an image is just an image, no matter what the caption you have underneath. And Margarita's works frequently display a juxtaposition of ordinary objects in an unusual setting or context, giving new meanings to familiar things. So, making the familiar things look unfamiliar, making the known things look unknown, making the banal and commonplace things look very mysterious was one of the main concerns of uh, Magrithi. For example, when he paints a uh, rose, he made a rose inside a room, and when he kind of um, magnifies the scale of the rose to the extent that it occupies the entire room. Now, this relationship becomes very absurd. As far as the identity of the rose, the feel of the flower rose, as far as the space that room occupies, we really do not have any problem. But the moment <coughs> you see this incongruity, this absurdity, that you cannot have such a big rose inside a small room, either the room is too small or the rose is too big, either way it is improbable, impossible. It is this impossibility that Margarita is trying to uh, evoke a sense of impossibility. So, in fact, when you're looking at the eye of a person, what you're supposed to see is the eye. You're not supposed to see the sky inside the eye. So, hence Margarita calls this the false mirror. In fact, he was obsessed with the image of mirror and he has done some more interesting paintings of mirror where you can see that a person standing in front of the mirror and what is usually expected is that you'll be able to see your face, but instead you see your back in the mirror. Now, this is pretty unnerving and very scary that you stand in front of a uh, mirror and you'll never be able to see your face, your front. A mirror is supposed to show your front, not your back. Now, so Margarita reverses the function of the mirror and thus making the experience of looking at that painting very uncanny, like this one. When you look at the toes, it's a beautifully painted pair of feet. As you look up, you find a pair of toes. So, you know, which one is true? Is it a pair of toes or a pair of feet? It is a kind of a visual conundrum, a visual riddle. And this is where these paintings actually stay. They don't really offer a simple solution. For example, this one. He plays with the scale and also creates an absurd relationship between the different objects by altering, changing, and playing with the individual scale as well as relative scale in terms of their size and proportion. But this is what you are supposed to appreciate and study, what exactly is happening. Not that there is an immense amount of mystery, because Margaret's paintings in that sense are not narrative paintings. They don't tell you a story, but they uh, evoke, or you can even say Margaret's paintings, provoke you to think the cognitive 
initiative about the cognitive challenges or to address the challenges that our, our habit of perception might often face when one encounters something like this. Yes, this is a mirror that I was talking about. We stand in front of the mirror and instead of seeing your face or front, this is what you find. Your back is projected on the mirror. So, we create this impossible impossibility by executing uh, with an amount of uh, skill and dexterity which uh, makes the image even more convincing for us. Or, either it is a large size, giant size fruit or a very miniature size room which holds the fruit, it capsulates the fruit. Apart from Dali and Magritte, we also have artists like E. Stanford. In his paintings, we do not find anything much recognizable as elements, either figures or objects or animals. But the space and the elements and the objects and the presence of light and cast shadow in his paintings evoke a sense of surreality. You almost tend to feel that you have been to this place, you know this place, but then the forms themselves are completely unknown to you and then the space also looks otherworldly, not a part of your own general experience. So what sense do you make out of these paintings, either this or that? You actually cannot make any sense, really speaking. And it is this lack or, or let us say not lack of sense, but let me put it this way, it is the inability, it is the deficiency of our rational, conscious uh, mind. That is what most of the surrealist painters may try to address. That, because otherwise, mm, we tend to depend and rely too much on our conscious and our rational ability. What surrealist artists are trying to bring up as a major serious issue that there could be moments in life and art where rationality fails or our conscious mind fails and we have no other alternative but to submit to the real world the unconscious and the irrational. Now to wind up, not only painters, but in surrealist group, we also uh, find sculptors like Mary Oppenheim, who makes car covered cup, saucer spoon, or what in other terms is known as soft sculpture. Then again, the softness of the spoon, saucer, and cup creates an impossibility in terms of their functionality. Hence, a surrealist feeling is evoked. Now, surrealism as a movement, again, like other movements, uh, might uh, had an expiry date as a movement, but uh, its impact on art, its impact on our thinking about art, on our expectation of art, is still extremely alive because surrealism is something as an idea, as a philosophy, maybe the surrealist style has become a little dated, but surrealism as an idea is still relevant and still strong and a lot of artists all over the world still find surrealism a very interesting proposition and a very relevant and meaningful philosophical framework to work within.